The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Grand Rounds is part of our Clarity program. Clarity is a, a faculty, staff, and house staff development program for oral and written communication. Uh, and one of those initiatives is to learn to succinctly in an entertaining, engaging way, uh, uh, oral, um, orally, some um, information. And uh, Jane Eastdown has agreed to uh, give one of these three-minute talks. It's an international initiative. Uh, there's even a competition. So if Jane does a really good job, we can invite her to... Uh, to compete that internationally. Um, the plan is uh, going forward that uh, junior faculty and then ultimately probably fellows will be doing this with their uh, research or other um, topics they'd like to present uh, in the same way. So think of it like a, a rapid TED talk. Jane Easdown, one of our uh, distinguished professors uh, has agreed to, uh, to tell us today about a topic of interest to, to her. All right, thank you very much. Um, so good morning and welcome to my three minute talk. And I'm gonna be talking about the topic of lifelong learning. This is very important to me in my career and I believe uh, very important for all of us. This year I celebrate my 40th anniversary of graduation from medical school. And I've been 30 years as a practicing anesthesiologist. When I completed my training, I knew every answer to a multiple choice question. And I cruised for many years on the strength of that knowledge. And then things changed. I expected to see new medications. And I remember that um, we used to have these huge banquets. And I remember one seafood banquet to celebrate the uh, Sioux fentanyl. Um, in the days when pharmaceutical companies were able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give us and ply us with these medications. I experienced the arrival of the pulse oximeter, uh, the end tidal CO2 monitor, fiber optic devices to manage the airway. And um, these were all new from residency days. There were some diseases that were completely cured and disappeared, and then new ones appeared, things like AIDS and um, now, of course, COVID. Um, there were some surgical procedures that I know really well that no longer exist, but they were replaced by things like transplant of all different organs and robotics, um, and in the future, artificial intelligence. Um, for those of us in teaching centers, not only did we have to keep up and to teach ourselves, but we also had to turn around and, and train others as well. So I became very committed to lifelong learning. My career has been focused on medical education and to be teaching all types of learner and uh, level of learners. In addition to direct education, I've also been involved in creating educational modules on patient safety. And I do this through the American Society of Anesthetists, the ASA. And that's, again, for a wide variety of learners. And I might mention to you that many of these uh, courses are complementary. All of us are required to demonstrate professional development continuously, um, and these materials assist with that. My point about lifelong learning is this. You may think that by passing your boards and being fully qualified, that that is a final goal. And it is a terrific accomplishment, but your careers will take you to new places and they will, take, they will be for there for many years. You came into anesthesiology because you were curious about physiology and pharmacology, about technology, human behavior. And I suggest that you start now to maintain that curiosity, that you find a way to keep up that you truly enjoy. And that can be journals that you read, podcasts, videos, that could be conferences, live or online learning. 
my lifelong learning has been going on now for 40 years, as I mentioned, and it has been a great delight. And I wish the same enjoyment for all of you in your careers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Um, super inspiring to, uh, to think about, and I think it uh, is a terrific lead in uh, for our speaker today, uh, Dr. Blair, who uh, I think has had a, a mirror career um, over the years uh, with yours as well. Uh, I think that everyone on the one hand knows Dr. Blair and maybe sometimes we don't know all of the details about somebody. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes telling you about him. Um, before he completed his formal education, he was a hospital foreman in the US Navy from 1968 to 72. Um, he, I know that we have some of our SRNAs with us today whose parents may not have been born in 1968 to 72. So uh, we, Dr. Blair has uh, been in the midst of education and lifelong learning for, uh, for truly for generations now. Um, he graduated from Iowa State with a BS in zoology and then did his uh, undergraduate medical training uh, and graduated in 1983 and did an anesthesia internship and residency at University of Iowa and then did a, a neuroanesthesia fellowship there that he completed in 1987. Um, after residency and fellowship, he completed five years uh, more in the Navy, uh, serving as an anesthesiologist and particularly specializing in neuromonitoring for uh, complex spine procedures. And uh, he, he left the Navy and was in uh, private practice for about 15 years uh, before coming to Vanderbilt in 2007, where he has uh, been serving in the division of neuroanesthesia since then. I think everyone probably knows that he is uh, a leading expert that you, if you bump into him and ask about lidocaine or guanfacine or any alpha-2 agent uh, and a variety of other topics that, uh, that you can get uh, an all-day uh, education conference one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, and that's also true when it comes to neuromonitoring. And uh, he's going to uh, deliver the first of probably a series of talks today about how we really understand uh, what it would be to monitor the brain and, and to think about uh, maybe how that should be a monitor um, that we use and really understand better uh, in the months and years to come. So uh, Dr. Blair, thank you for all the time that you've put into preparing this talk and uh, we look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much, Matt, I appreciate it. Um, let, me, uh, let me sort of jump in here and share this screen. All right, there we go. Apologize for the delay. Right. So you should be hearing me. Uh, this is a talk about EEG that I'm going to try and, and get through as quickly as I can that uh, basically is, is about something of the nuts and bolts of how EEG works. So these are the people to whom I owe a great deal of credit for uh, putting this presentation together. They are uh, uh, mostly from Harvard, which is not surprising, and uh, they uh, at least Dr. Brown and Dr. Uh, Purden have been here to talk. Uh, Jamie Slay is from New Zealand and has uh, done a lot of things uh, relating to EEG in the, in the bigger world stage. So electroencephalography is basically a, a technology that was, that's about 100 years old now. Hans Berger was the first to, to perform a, a, an electroencephalogram on a human. It's clinically used for sleep, seizure disorder, coma, encephalopathies, and so on. Uh, in anesthesia, uh, we have developed methods for processing a subset of the EEG that give us the opportunity to be able to do intraoperative monitoring, anesthetic agent monitoring, and potentially the study of consciousness itself. So I'm going to go through some of this sort of beginning stuff fairly quickly, but basically our current standard of anesthesia is to monitor the heart rate and systemic arterial pressure. Uh, these Blood pressure and heart rate changes are the principal physiologic signals that we use to monitor anesthesia. Our current anesthesia monitoring relies heavily on these physiologic signals, and we infer brain states from these signals. That's a little bit off base because we're really not doing anything to directly look at the head. Blood pressure and heart rate are really only indirect monitors of, of brain state. Um, so if you would want to add a neuro exam to this, um, 
Essentially, EEG might be the tool that you would consider. Uh, we perform neuro exams at the emergence um, from neurosurgical procedures, certainly, and most of us get the tube out somehow uh, by um, a kind of mystical voodoo that uh, we sort of assure that someone can guard their airway and so on, but we don't really do anything uh, generally except make sure they can open their eyes, and that's kind of about the limit is that we ask them to open their eyes, and, and, uh, and for the most part, they, they do, and we take the tube out. But EEG is a sort of a special type of exam that could be used uh, as um, and considered as something that you could you could place along with your blood pressure cuff and your uh, EKG leads and your SAT monitor and leave them on until the end. In fact, if you place them before induction, you get a, a potentially a lot of information that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, anesthet anesthetics induce oscillations in the brain and these oscillations are the primary means by which anesthetics create the altered states that we're going to, to look at. Um, the, monitoring these oscillations may serve us as the best real-time monitor of brain state. Um, changes in the unprocessed EEG and spectrogram are directly related to anesthetic class, dose, me mechanism of action, and patient age. So this is this is sort of the heart of, uh, heart of the process. We're hoping that the EEG is going to give us information that's going to tell us more about what the patient, what's going on with the patient than just the basic monitors. So what is general anesthesia? General anesthesia is a drug-induced coma. It's not sleep. Uh, we're gonna talk a little about sleep, but basically it involves unconsciousness, which is isolation from the environment. Antinociception, this is not analgesia, which is a pain state that has to do with being aware. Uh, this is, it also involves amnesia and akinesis. Uh, normally, we uh, attempt to provide stability of physiologic systems, including the autonomic cardiovascular, respiratory, and thermoregulatory systems as a component of our anesthetic management. So these are the neurotransmitters and the brain systems that, that mediate both sleep and anesthesia. The first four are what we consider the normal uh, stimulating or arousing neurotransmitters. Uh, GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine is another attention and, um, uh, high, and thalamic arousal uh, neurotransmitter. Orexin is uh, a, a, actually a family, a family of small peptides that help to support normal wakefulness. And glutamate, of course, is, is ubiquitous and is, although a major neurotransmitter, uh, normally pretty much everywhere in the brain. These areas that we're interested in are the areas of the central brain, the subthalamic regions, the pons, the upper pons and brainstem. This is where the majority of these centers lie and they produce uh, neurotransmitters that are then carried into all the brain. When we go to sleep, there's a flip and you see the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus come into play. It, it, it secretes GABA and inhibits most of these hypothalamic centers. So, it's a flip-flop, as I'll show here in a moment. This is how this works. These hypothalamic centers, all of these going to sleep with the um, gabatone cutting them all out. Um, this is a flip-flop switch, basically. You have normally these centers uh, that are in, uh, excitatory online, producing in a wakeful state, orexin supporting that wakeful state, and GABA being suppressed. When we get sleepy and go to sleep, the switch flips, GABA takes the four, helps to close down these centers, and the orexins then are shut down as well. So this flip-flop switch is the normal circadian effect. This is what the EEG looks like in, in uh, the sleep state. For sleep, you have uh, first beginning with awakeness, a low amplitude, high frequency state that is a, what would be called a beta gamma buzz. Uh, you're awake with your eyes open. When you close your eyes, there's no longer information um, really coming to the, to the frontal cortex. And so there's a, there's a shift and you get this, this alpha signal in the occipital region. This dorsal uh, to frontal shift is something that is a characteristic of anesthesia as we'll see. Normally with anesthesia, the initial effect that you get is what's called paradoxical excitation. You, this can be very early in the use of ketamine, propofol, or the cocktail party effect. This is uh, something we're all familiar with. The first drink gives you that little buzz, and this is the buzz of that first drink. Um, the uh, rest of the anesthetic state is basically a, 
a kind of an enlarging excitatory state with an increase in slow wave activity. Uh, and then eventually you wind up with a, at deeper states burst suppression, which is actually a, a top edge of coma. And at a very deep states, isoelectricity. You never get these states in sleep. Sleep, you do wind up with the, the slower alpha activity. Um, and in very deep sleep, it's a blend of most of the frequencies of EEG. The REM state looks very much like the awake EEG. So these, these combinations are things that, although they have similarities, they are not at all the same. How do we get there? Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Frederick Bremer who uh, did some uh, preparations in 1935 looking at brainstem arousal. His first preparation was what he called encephal isole, where he cut the brainstem, uh, cut the, uh, the cord, basically the high cord, and left the brainstem intact and connected to the brain. What he got was all of these centers in the upper in the pons and uh, upper medulla, and they were all still online feeding information to cortex. And so the EEG looked basically awake. On the other hand, he, he did a preparation called cervello isole, where he cut basically cut the cerebrum out of the, out of the system and took these centers offline and wound up with an asleep EEG. So this is a preparation that was one of the first to demonstrate that these centers in the, in the center of the head, subthalamic area, are very, very important in normal arousal. The take home for anesthesia is that anesthetics block these brainstem inputs into thalamus and cortex and lead to a production of slow delta oscillations by reducing excitatory inputs to thalamus and cortex, thereby, thereby producing hyperpolarization of the cortex. This is kind of the soul of what our drugs do. So what is the EEG to start with? It is a set of bioelectric potentials in the brain that are created by a flow of ion-based currents in the volume of cortex. That's kind of the long story short. There are two types of act, uh, two types of potentials that produce this. There are regenerative action potentials, which are these larger signals, and there are uh, presynaptic potentials, both excitatory and inhibitory, that are smaller in size and last longer. Uh, together, these yield spiking neuronal events, which aggregate to create the EEG oscillations that we're familiar with. These are detectable on the surface of the head as a result of consolidation of these currents in the areas where they're produced and eventually uh, developing macroscopic currents that you can measure on the scalp. So these are those potentials. You have uh, excitatory and inhibitory presynaptic uh, potentials generated by uh, things on both the uh, dendrites and cell bodies of the neurons. The postsynaptic activity that's generated thus is a net of these, uh, these basically spikes, and these spikes are the things that, that we uh, eventually can see as, as waveforms. Here you've got spiking in a, a single uh, thalamocortical neuron, where in the thalamic field you've got uh, an EEG that is alpha in frequency. You have also theta waves. So there's actually a broadband of these that are, that are piped from thalamus up into cortex, and that activity is, this is just the same thing slowed down. So these are the states that we see uh, when you, you start to see people going to sleep. So this is the, the, how those local field potentials actually work. They actually create these loops of currents. And if you've got all of these things looping together, then that looping creates uh, a net uh, electrical signal that can be read through these almost antenna-like uh, uh, dendrites and axons that send their signal north to the, to the skull. So you have action potential spiking, local field potentials as a result, a summation of those into uh, signals that are sent through the antenna to the scalp. That is essentially how this works. So let's look at recordings. These are the basic fre frequency signals that we look at normally. These are the ones that, uh, that are the major components. These are the delta oscillations, which are uh, zero to four hertz, theta oscillations, which are uh, four to eight hertz, alpha oscillations, eight to 12 hertz, and beta oscillations, generally 12 to 25 hertz. There's another layer above, which is gamma, they are relatively low in power usually, but they run from 25 up to as high as 200 hertz. 
So the two major tools that we're looking at here, we're, we're looking at parsing these signals into frequency, which is the number of cycles per second in Hertz, and an amplitude, which is a power based in decibels. This is the wave height peak to trough, and this is a logarithmic scale. These recordings are done by uh, neurologists using a thing called the 1020 system. You have a large number of leads that are placed on the head and you obtain this very complex multi-lead. This is a 21 lead EEG. The full EEG is difficult to read. The neurologists fight over these things. This was done originally on a long sheet of paper, uh, reams of paper really, and it's now done of course on a computer. This is the code that you should be putting in. And I'll give you a minute to give that a whirl. All right, so let's move on to process the EG. This is a signal that was taken off of one of the, the BIS monitors that we use. Just looking at that and then trying to inspect that, you couldn't really say that you know what you're seeing unless you've looked at a lot of these. Um, it's just, as John Tinker used to say, a bunch of squiggly lines. And that's really the way a lot of people look at this. They look at it and they kind of go, hmm, that's interesting. Well, I guess there's activity there, but I don't know what it means. And, and uh, I'm going to look at the big numbers on the screen and, and pay attention to those. This is what we'd like to get to is a signal that, that actually has a whole lot more information in it. So how does this occur? Um, basically, process DEG is the application of algorithms uh, to the signals that we derive from uh, uh, two to four leads on the frontal uh, in a frontal EEG montage. Um, the calculations are performed in the frequency domain and involve a, uh, a method called fast Fourier transform. Uh, the algorithms that these uh, come from are generally proprietary and the indexes that they support track suppression of high frequency EEG activity and activation of low frequency oscillations as triggered by our anesthetics. These are the, some of the monitors that are available. This is the old physiometrics. This is before the set line, but this was the original set line. Um, this is what we're going to be getting, this system here. Um, this is the BIS that you are, uh, should, should mostly be familiar with. There are, this is the Nar Narcotrend, which is a German machine. Uh, this is GM's Entropy. This is actually a component of their main screen monitor. Um, it should be noted that these are cortical activity monitors. You're not anywhere near a full EEG, and these are not depth of anesthesia monitors, although that's what we commonly think of them as. This is the set line. This is what you're going to be seeing. This monitor collects six leads on the forehead, four, four leads of, uh, of, of actual EEG, and you can see the different components of the EEG that are available on this device. This is what the uh, the sensor is going to look like. So this is the guy who was kind of the father of the of the process. Uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier is a Frenchman who uh, actually went to Egypt with Napoleon. Uh, so he was uh, he was in uh, the Napoleonic era, a physicist and mathematician. And what he did was recognize the fact that complex waveforms could be parsed uh, into uh, uh, basically smaller components that would give you a histogram of their components. You have here a fast, uh, relatively low amplitude signal and a high, amp uh, a, a high amplitude, low frequency signal. So these two signals are overlaid. And here the histogram gives you the low amplitude, high power signal and the, uh, I'm sorry, low frequency, high power signal and high frequency, low power signal. So this is basically the, how, how he, this all got started. If you then apply that to the signal at a single instance, so you've got EEG piling out of the head for a moment, you, you record that, and this is the histogram that occurs. And you can then basically digitize that and see delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. This is like a snapshot, like you would take an EKG. Uh, so if you then start by um, looking at how this is going to work uh, in the flow of that data acquisition. Uh, you start with a raw EEG trace and 
This is then placed through the FAST Fourier transform, which is broken down into your histogram. This is a single unit of time. You then start to stack these histograms so that they wind up with uh, an advancing image in time. This is the time axis. And the power here is given to you in this false color generated image of the EEG. So this is the frequency on this axis, time on this axis. If you then rotate this signal, you get what we now know is the um, CDSA or color density spectral array. Here you have frequency on the Y axis, time on the X axis, and each of these color signals are the basically the power of those different uh, frequencies as you see them there. So this is how, the, the, how we get to the, the color density spectral array. And there is, as you will come to understand, a lot more information in this. There are limits to all of these systems. This is the caveat in the, in the whole talk. Frontally EJ-based indices do not prevent recall. That's kind of the first and foremost. That's, uh, recall itself is a, is a whole talk. And I'm not going to, to go deeply into that. But basically, that's uh, one of the things that we can't really rely on these things for. The indices were developed for adult, from adult data and not really so far reliable in children, although there's a tremendous amount of work being done in the pediatric population. They don't give an accurate picture of the brain's response, especially relative to the power shifts that occur in aging. Uh, they all assume that the, quote, level of unconsciousness that's provided by the different anesthetics is the same, but we know that different receptors and different circuits and different networks act and work in different ways. And so you don't really get the same, quote, level of unconsciousness or even necessarily the same type of unconsciousness from our different agents. EEGs confound the actions of uh, anesthetic, uh, confound all input and output from, from elderly patients. The BIST, uh, this is one of the major problems with it, tends to read low power. Uh, and the monitor in certain settings will actually tell you that the patient's waking up, the BIST number climbs you know the patient is deeply asleep. And so this is a problem that has existed basically since the device has been around and it's a, it's a, it's a function of how the algorithm works. The BIS EMG is another confounder. It produces a signal that's four to five times greater in power than the EEG that's trying to leak out underneath it. And that's one of the things that tends to drive it. That's also the thing that drives the apparent effect of the quote, wake up that you get from ketamine. A current awareness monitors, as I said, are practical for routine use because they're easy to apply, but they're not grounded currently in any cognitive neuroscience of consciousness. That is to say, yet, yeah, there is a tremendous amount of work being done to use these monitoring systems to actually plumb the depths of consciousness. Um, so examples, if you take the NMDA drugs, they all affect NMDA receptors differently. If you take dexmedetomidine, it has different populations of receptor sites, and so DEX acts very, with varying effects at each of those receptor sites. The benzodiazepines, propofol, etomidate, the varying GABA drugs have varying GABA effects because there are multiple sites on, on these receptors that work in different ways. Thalamic effects of all of the agents differ from cortical effects. So this is to say that these systems have limitations, and these are the things that we need to pay attention to when we're using them. The brain is not dynamic, or the brain is in a dynamic state under general, general anesthesia. It doesn't get turned off. Um, anesthetics induce and sustain oscillations that block communications between brain areas. So basically, the brain is, is still active. It's just not talking to itself. It's not working together. These oscillations are readily visible in the EEG, and these oscillations can be used to, to track brain state. So what are the basic mechanisms. There are four, uh, there's actually probably a fifth, but I'm going to deal with the, the four primary ones, these cortical and thalamic changes that occur. Uh, alpha rhythms are in the eight to 12 Hertz range. This, the signal sets up and you wind up with the, the thalamus and cortex talking to each other. And as they speak, this becomes a narrow band of communication and doesn't really let much other information through. In uh, frontal and actually all cortical uh, regions, you get this slow wave activity that this is a, a function of a GABA uh, cortical interneuronal in, sort of uh, disruption of uh, 
normal uh, normal function. So you get small areas that that uh, although they're still working are not talking to each other. There's a mechanism that's called anteriorization, which I'll show you in a moment. And then there's these brainstem areas that I described earlier relative to sleep that get shut down by uh, GABA, GABAminergic activity, this, uh, the, either, either in the brain with normal sleep or with the drugs that we use. So blocking these arousal pathways is basically the fourth component. So these are the first two. You have a frontal alpha wave that occurs with this disruption of thalamocortical uh, activity, and that is demonstrated uh, in virtually 90% of our drugs with this uh, alpha signal, a very loud alpha note, and it literally kind of drowns out all other communication along those lines. There are slow oscillations. Again, this is the slow oscillations associated with cortical changes. So the cortical state before loss of consciousness, you, if you look at these, these traces, they are pretty much in sync and there's, there's not a, any single, single activity. So this, is, this comes from, uh, from corticography that's used in, uh, in looking for seizure foci. When uh, the surgeons are getting ready to take them out, they put these, these little probes down on the cortex and they actually measure cortical activity. When you look at these patients, um, as you put them to sleep, you start to see this, these slow waves develop, and these slow waves are a function of this alteration of GABA uh, activity in, in various localized regions. But these areas are, lose the phase or the synchrony that they had before you went uh, to sleep, so they're, they're not really talking to each other. They're all talking, but there's no communication. So that loss of regional phase coupling is basically the primary change that occurs. So between these two, you have the, uh, the changes that, that are the GABA tone associated with this. Uh, long, long ago, this is uh, 1997, 40 plus years ago, John Tinker and John Mitchenfelder uh, described the anterior shift of dominant EEG activity during anesthesia in the Java monkey. Turns out that we're all monkeys too, this happens in humans. So the dominant EEG activity in, in a normal brain is posterior. You can't really see much up front because it's a very diffuse signal uh, until you start to put it to sleep. As soon as you put it to sleep, there's an abrupt appearance of frontal EEG dominance that occurs with all of these normal agents. Um, that response is consistent with the loss of lid reflex and the loss of the ability to respond to command. Uh, that, that shift, uh, goes back again when you go below, below about 0.4 max. So it's it's basically something that turns um, the, This anterior EEG shift is a signal of a loss of consciousness. Now, uh, as I said, that it's not something that, uh, that we can necessarily hang our hat on, but it is certainly one of the major mechanisms. It's been done more recently by uh, Ali Semenser, um, where um, essentially you see a, a EEG uh, on the surface of the head. Here is this loud signal that's going on in the posterior brain. The rest of the brain is relatively quiet. Um, then this this is done with three humans, and they increase propofol over over five uh, different uh, levels. This is an 84 minute trace that's going to be chewed down to nine seconds to make it presentable. But what you'll see here is this anteriorization of this signal. There it is posterior and it jumps to the anterior portion of the head and the back gets a little quieter. So here you've got this loud, uh, loud alpha and delta signal. This is, this is this anteriorization that occurs. So you can see there's some information probably in the subthalamic regions as well. Um, this is a remarkable uh, picture and something that uh, is, is demonstrated here again. So this is looking down on that array from above. Here you see this awake baseline with the, the posterior signal as the patient goes to sleep, loss of consciousness with a big anteriorization of the signal, and again, a return of consciousness with this awake emergence. So again, these two components of that alpha shift that we, we looked at earlier. Uh, looking again at the brainstem, you, you've got this wash-in of uh, substances that we, we give. We, we pl 
inject these into uh, the circulation. They go up, up through the basilar artery and very rapidly envelop the, the base of the brain uh, where you have all of these senators, the motor respiratory centers, the uh, pontine uh, arousal centers, all of these get taken out and you wind up with apnea, atonia, and a loss of consciousness. Uh, these are the postural muscles. If the person was standing when you gave them the drug, no surprise, you'd fall down. So these are some of the anesthetic agents that are the common agents that we use. We're going to look at propofol, dex, the, the gases, ketamine, and the narcotics. We're going to look a little bit at aging and at least at one instance of a, a single case. So the signatures of the common agents. Again, if you were to just look at these signals as EEG on a screen, what you would see is uh, what John Tinker used to say, this, this is good, they're, they're, they're alive, uh, there's, there's brain activity. But to parse these and separate them one from the other by inspection alone would, uh, to the untutored eye at least, be somewhat more difficult. If you add, however, this color density spectra array, which I just showed you, you have the opportunity to get a whole lot more information. And, and these, these traces are clearly much more, much more different from one another than, uh, than the traces that the, the, e e the raw EEG would show you. So you've got propofol, which has this signal, CO with this signal, DEX with this, and ketamine here, and I'm gonna show you those individually. So again, the mechanism of propofol is this uh, lamocortical uh, loud sound and the synchrony that occurs in cortex between various areas. This, if you actually went to the trouble to peel the lids back after you give a dose of propofol, will give you doll's eyes, which is not something that we ordinarily look for. Uh, neurologists may look for it for their entire lives and not find it, but we can, we can create it every day if you just look for it. So these are um, the uh, EEGs that you get from propofol. These, these look the same, but you can see that the time course is very different. So in this one, they got 200 milligrams of propofol as a single bolus. This is the awake state, again, a diffuse, EEG with uh, some basic, uh, probably a little verset up front. And what you see is a sudden drop of signal uh, to a nearly burst suppression, but then rapid return of a signal and you see the alpha uh, activity come back and a nice delta baseline signal. These two white lines are basically power spectrum lines. This, this upper one is the 95% power spectrum, below which 95% of the power of the EEG lies. The lower one is what would be considered the uh, median power spectrum. Uh, if you look in this patient, it's a little bit different. Uh, even though he got the same 200 of propofol, he got it 100 and then 50, and then just for fun, another 50. And what happens is you can see that this is not as highly energetic an EEG up front as you saw with this patient. So no surprise, here you've got almost 15 minutes of burst suppression that occurs. This, this signal is, is burst suppression. You don't, see, you don't see much of that alpha signal at all. And so these responses are very different to that 200 of propofol. This again is to look at burst suppression. You can see this, this change that occurs where there's, there's these bursts of activity that pop through where you can see little, little jumps of, of, of bits of, of EEG popping through, but it's very hard to pull out much of the, the alpha that should be in there. So dexmedetomidine is a little bit different. It produces a signal that has some, of the simil some similarity to, uh, to, to propofol, but not anywhere near exactly the same. It, this is a, a result of its actions in locus ceruleus, which is the brain source of norepinephrine. So the locus ceruleus is again one of these uh, pontine um, centers that normally produces um, a signal that, of, of noradrenergic tone that goes to all portions of cortex. Uh, when this gets shut down, it essentially, um, the, the normal tone in, uh, in the uh, preoptic area, the, this, this where, where, where the GABA tone comes from, uh, that gets disinhibited and then it takes over and shuts everything else down. Uh, there's also a loss of uh, 
of noradrenergic tone in cortex. So it can work in cortex directly, it can work in the brainstem, and it can work uh, in the thalamus directly. At high dose, it works in the thalamus to produce um, actually general anesthesia. This is one of the few drugs that is a single agent will take the thalamus out, which produces a profound general anesthetic state. This was actually uh, demonstrated in a series of case reports uh, from uh, Dr. John Ramsey, who is the, the author of the Ramsey score. Um, he gave enough Presidex to uh, four individuals uh, to actually obtain general anesthesia with that agent alone. Um, you'd say, well, their pressure will go into the toilet. It doesn't. Alpha 2B activities peripherally supports blood pressure. Um, the thalamus is that is that neighborhood uh, that that winds up getting potentially potentially whacked, but there's normally some some activity loss there, and that is another component of anesthesia. The characteristic of uh, the EEG is an intermittent spindle activity, which is what you see here. So you have a, a normally this de um, delta activity underneath everything, and then there's this kind of little tickles of uh, wisps of uh, alpha beta. Uh, spindle activity that are characteristic. This is a lighter, lighter anesthetic. This would be kind of more sedation. This is a 0.65 mics per kilo dose. And down here at higher dose, the spindles tend to go away. You can, uh, if you keep going up with it, you can obtain a state that, that doesn't have much in the alpha beta range. So this is the basic popular signal associated with dexmedetomidine. Um, ketamine. Uh, the interesting thing about ketamine, most interesting thing, is that the alpha component of uh, the EEG is basically gone. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have much of an alpha component that has to do with uh, the fact that it uh, alters these GABA inhibitory neurons. So this is the cocktail party effect. This is the stimulating effect uh, of ketamine. It produces a, it, it takes out these cortical inner neurons uh, so that, so that the, the GABA tone is not really there, so this leaves uh, normal uh, normal activity or some more normal activity going on in cortex. Um, there are also some some net stimulation uh, when GABA is cut in the in these uh, low low brain regions. Um, so the net is that uh, you have a, a two component signal again with this high. Uh, beta gamma buzz. And this is the thing that, as I said earlier, drives the BIS crazy. Uh, and this is what this looks like. So this is an awake state. Here you've got this alternation of gamma and delta bursting. So there's a, this is a bounce, signal bounces back and forth between delta and gamma. This is at lower dose. When you get up to higher dose, then you get this beta gamma buzz continuously and the delta signal continuously. This is what that looks like. Here you've got a single hit of a large hit of ketamine up front. So you get a sudden shift to this beta gamma noise and the delta that remains. At this point, they kicked in forane, and forane basically cuts it down, and here you see the delta signal pop in. So this is to say that you can literally see the changes associated with your anesthetic agents as you make those changes. Um, these are isoflurane and desflurane which are very, very, very similar to propofol. Uh, they have a bit of, of, a, of a theta fill-in that occurs between the alpha and the, and the delta signals, but they look very, very much like uh, um, propofol. So if you want to add nitrous to the picture, this is, uh, this is now, we're, now we're taking a, an NMDA drug and adding it to isoflurane. So here we've got isoflurane, your, your basic alpha, alpha beta. This is uh, um, at a little bit even, uh, uh, you, see a, you see a shift here where they, they drop nitrous in here and they drop the isoflurane, at least theoretically to try and get the, the isoflurane out a little quicker. Uh, and you see a, you see a fairly, fairly rapid shift in, in about four minutes, you see this change where the isoflurane gets quieter and you, you wind up with more slow oscillations. And so 
these slow oscillations are a characteristic of nitrous oxide. So you wind up with this big, very, they're actually very large signals. And you can see some remaining beta gamma oscillations uh, left over here. That's, that's the, this is kind of the brain starting to sort of, sort of come around. So um, this combination is a, is, a, is a common change and it's something that you can see very readily with the EEG. Sevoflurane is, uh, is sort of the odd duck. Uh, at, at varying doses, you get this um, um, beta gamma oscillation and also normal delta oscillation. But then you see this theta zipping and unzipping in the, in the middle. This activity is a, is a kind of a classic change with, uh, with sevoflurane at higher doses. It com almost completely fills in. This theta signal becomes a very prominent component. Um, so this is just to show the difference between SIBO and, and propofol. SIBO has got this big theta signal and propofol does not. So let's look at the opioids very quickly. Um, normally opioids, I don't have, I don't have EEG pictures. Uh, Dr. Purden is actually working on that as we speak. Uh, but the, um, the net effect here is that as we know, opioids act in the spinal cord uh, to produce uh, uh, opioid, to alter opioid sites in, the, in, that, in that neighborhood. Then up the back in this uh, normal arousal reticular activating network up the back, uh, it takes out centers where normal acetylcholinergic tone uh, would be activating thalamus. So th this is a, actually a, an acetylcholinergic mode of action, which is not something that we normally think of. But that's basically how it works, at least in the central nervous system. If you look at these, these in terms of pharmacodynamics of these drugs, here you've got uh, alfentanil and, uh, and fentanyl. With fentanyl over here, the, the drug comes online. It's, it's being it basically given over a, a period of uh, a relatively short period of time. And then it falls away up, down its pharmacodynamic uh, curve, the same with uh, uh, Alfentanil, and then there's this sort of spectral lag. The, the EEG spectrum kind of gets up there, and then it takes a while for it to taper off in both instances. The kinetics are different, so the, the spectral edge differences are a function of the kinetics. But for both drugs, you see uh, basically as, as you infuse the drugs, and over time, you see a slowing of the EEG. And this is, this, this is basically exactly what these drugs produce is a, is a change in EEG to slow them. So let's look a little bit at aging. So not surprising, the frontal oscillatory peaks are affected by both age and anesthetic concentration. And this is exactly that. So you've got the peak alpha frequency over here and what would be considered uh, the MAC of the drugs. So as you get older it takes uh, you start you start out lower and it takes less drug to get you further down essentially this is uh, how how these uh, how humans respond with age so these are the these are the young patients uh, up here it takes more to, to do them and and it's at, even at their at their highest here they're almost twice as much uh, as you would you would need for uh, an older patient. These, these, uh, these curves are well known. Um, the spectrogram of uh, infants, this is a very, very interesting thing. This is something that they've relatively recently started looking at. Here you see a, uh, this is up to about three months and you just don't see this is, these are, these are uh, um, infants being put to sleep. You don't see any alpha band here to speak of. There's just not much of an alpha signal. Suddenly at four months, bang, it snaps in. You see the alpha signal begin to appear. And so this is the beginning of the changes that we normally think of as this thalamocortical oscillation coming to the fore as a component of anesthesia. Here, there's really not much to disrupt. And here that disruption begins. So let's look at this relative to age. If we, if we key on this guy to start with here, this is a 56-year-old gentleman who has really, this is again in response to propofol, really not much delta going on, not much, not really any alpha going on, 
And this guy is not much different from the 81 year old over here who is yet a little stir still further down the tree, but, but basically these guys are the same. If you jump back to this 57 year old, these two are virtually the same in age. And yet here you have a, a relatively robust alpha signal and a delta signal. And this guy doesn't look much different than this 30-year-old. So the point is that, that age really is just a number, at least as far as EEG is concerned. So you, if you go on down the tree, of course, the kids are the ones that you would expect to have very, very loud, loud signals. Here's a, here's a three-year-old and a 14-year-old. But the, the point is that, that as, you, as you get up into the 30-year-old range, you see this shift. Why does this occur? In time, it's not really a loss of neurons. The neuron number really doesn't drop so much. The thing that drops off is the number of connections. The synapse count goes down. And you see that here uh, with the apical uh, oblique dendrites. There's a, a, a burst and a bump to about roughly age eight, which is kind of the, the max. And from there, it's kind of downhill. Um, so you know where I am in this picture. All right, for cortical thinning, this is also the same thing. These alpha generators uh, lie in the areas that wind up getting thinned the, the worst and the first. Um, the declining frontal power in the elderly is, a, is a, especially a waning of alpha power, and it occurs as a result of the thinning of, of either, uh, and this is, a, this is normal aging and Alzheimer's. You got the, the purple here are the, are the Alzheimer's players, but, the bottom line is that for both of these, you see this uh, frontal uh, alpha change that occurs uh, relative to neurodegeneration. Uh, you see the same thing uh, really starting at the, at the very beginning. This is again the last to develop where you see this, this alpha wave, the first thing that comes online when, uh, when uh, as I just demonstrated, they're very, very young, you begin to see the alpha wave occur in a very early point in time and it is the first to degenerate in aging. So this signal is, a, is, a, is an important signal for normal cortical uh, communication, and uh, changing it uh, is something that, uh, that happens with, with aging. So we've got zero to powerful, and then relatively powerful back towards zero. <laughs> this is how the brain uh, unfortunately accommodates with aging. So I'll take one patient here is a 64 year old female undergoing a mastectomy. Uh, this is this sort of standard regular vitals that you would expect. This looks pretty normal, 128 over 58, normal pulse ox. Um, everything looks, looks like it's going pretty well, but this is the EEG. You've got, they've actually been staring at 50 minutes of burst suppression. So this is to say that these numbers don't tell you about this. It's the sort of the take home message for the whole talk. And the idea is that we are going to be getting a device that will give us better information. I'll take some questions if you want. Jim, thank you so much um, for a terrific, uh, a terrific talk. Um, I know it's right at 730. And so people are going to start to have to drop off. Um, would you know there's been a lot of studies that have come out or several large studies have come out recently with the bis um and using a bis guided number uh not showing a difference in outcomes and yet there has been some difference in what you just noted between groups as far as birth suppression goes can you can you comment on whether we think using process deg can ultimately affect outcomes uh is it and could it be related to a different device or is should it be the target of birth suppression that we avoid? Well, I, there's a there's a there's been a actually a flurry of papers about about whether birth suppression is good or bad. Um, but for my money, I think having watched this go by for a long time, uh, it it has something to do with the device. The first device that we got, uh, you know, the, the the people who marketed it originally wanted to make it an awareness monitor, uh, and it clearly can't be that and is not that. Uh, and so we've been saddled with something that has an algorithm in it that, uh, that gives us um, some information and sometimes um, just because of the way the algorithm is built, erroneous information. 
And so the idea is that uh, with a better device and something that gives us a, a better way of, of slicing and dicing that information, we may have an opportunity to actually uh, do a better job uh, with both preventing birth suppression and uh, as time goes by, potentially um, even altering awareness or, or reducing awareness. And, and a question came in about how that would particularly relate in adults or children's to both delirium and post-operative cognitive dysfunction. That's a, that's actually an entire another lecture, and I had I had a, a pile of a pile of slides that I was going to try and get in there, but clearly this is a, this is a, even at this it was a stretch, especially with my boggle up front. So, um, cognitive dysfunction is something that that probably does have something to do with the with the depth of anesthesia and with obviously where you're starting so this is a would be a pitch for putting the monitor on to begin with and see what happens when you actually anesthetize someone um, not being surprised by uh, by how deep they get uh, rather than you know looking seeing what happens rather than than waiting to see what happens essentially um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that the new monitor monitors will give us more information and in fact there are probably su substantial research fields to plow to give us uh, give us an idea of where where we might be able to utilize these monitors to get us more information both about uh, uh, cognitive changes and uh, and certainly uh, about awareness and someone else asked with this information if if there's no definitive studies yet sh changing outcomes, but a sense that deep may too deep may still be bad, and that's individualized. Someone asked, um, "How close do we want to walk to the line between um, awake and uh, um, non-awake states?" And and uh, is there anything that would be a very clear signal that you could say would put you at risk for having intraoperative awareness or Conversely, avoiding it would um, reduce that risk. Well, certainly not with the BIS. I think that's that's pretty safe to say. Um, the the risk of awareness. This is something that we we would all. Uh, for instance, if you if you're running a, a TIVA on a spine, um, and they you know they say, well, we're done with the monitoring. Okay, so they so people automatically start shutting down all our infusions and turn on the gas because they're very comfortable with gas and they're <clears throat> pretty sure that the gas is going to, to guarantee that, uh, that the patient is asleep. Uh, but there's this, there's this constant fear that awareness occurs. And I've got, I've got, actually have a couple of slides that look at uh, the isolated forearm as a, as a sort of test for that. And clearly uh, the monitors, especially this um, frontal um, thalamocortical signal doesn't give us absolute insurance that um, that the patient is not aware is not is not uh, is not having some awareness now whether that comes into consciousness and whether they remember it is a is an entirely different thing uh, that requires obviously in you know post hoc interrogation and all that but the the point is that that awareness is something that there is currently no device that gives us something that is absolute proof uh, a prevention for. We don't have any truly exact preventive things. Um, the still the the, the 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 guy staring at the monitors is still the most important piece of the of the pie. Being able to look at the signals and understand what you're seeing and understand what they mean relative to the anesthetic that you're delivering, that's the most important part of the process. And I wish that I could say that that there was a magic device that would give you the answer, but there's not so far. Excellent. Well, thank you for a terrific talk. Anyone, if you have more questions, uh, I don't know if you email Dr. Blair that he'll get back to you. And um, as we get the device and we're uh, orienting everyone to the use of the, the appropriate use of the said line, we'll have uh, more education to come. So Jim, thank you again for a terrific talk. You bet. You're entirely welcome. Thank you all.